Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I have with me today a guest that, oh my gosh, the first time we met, I think, was at Duke, right? Yeah. At Duke University, yeah. um, at our PF1, which um, for those of you who are like, PF1, what is that? That's pelvic floor. <laughs> um, like, when was it? 10 years ago? That was the first pelvic health course I ever taught. Oh, wow. And I think that was in 2014. Wow. Oh, it's been a decade. Okay. Yeah. Y'all, time flies. And you know it does. But when you're sitting down with, um, especially since we've been through the pandemic, you, you sit down with people that, you know, you didn't get to see for a year or two years, or maybe you just, you met pre during the pandemic and you haven't even seen them and it's four years later, right? So anyway, I want to introduce Susanna Harmon to you all today. Welcome. Thank you. So happy to be here. I am glad that you're here. So you guys, we live in the same state and we never see each other. <laughs> I just had to ask her if she's coming to our national PT meeting, which we call CSM or combined sections for the American Physical Therapy Association. And so we live in the same state, but we're going to have to go to Boston to see each other. I'm going to give you a big hug. <laughs> big old hug. <laughs> <laughs> she is based out of Asheville and I want to brag on her a little bit. Um, she has a bunch of credentials behind her name, but I'm going to let her explain, uh, Susanna explain her expertise on all of this because she is a very respected advocate in the fields of pelvic health and breast cancer rehab. She treats patients in her private practice, your core PT, like I mentioned in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, if you're a pelvic he uh, health rehab provider, you may know her from teaching pelvic health series as a formal faculty member at Herman and Wallace. Or you've picked up maybe patient ed handouts, which I have seen, and they're awesome, from pelvichealthresources.com. Um, but her big passion is breast cancer rehab. And I wanted to bring her on the show today to talk about all the things that be can be done. Um, she addresses preventing and alleviating the side effects of breast cancer. Um, and for you, I'm going to let you just, that's probably how we'll start, is just describing that personal story with everyone um, and how close it was to you and, and what was born from that. Um, she turned to the research back in 2013, so over a decade ago, um, to create the first comprehensive breast cancer rehab course. And since then, there's thankfully been a flood of research um, course updates and it's been being taught globally. Um, is it all on demand? That course is all on demand, right? Yes, now it is. Um, I have taught it internationally in Australia and New Zealand as well. Uh, during COVID, I went to an online education platform. And, um, you know, that's been so special because, you know, I've been able to train people over in Pakistan and mm -hmm. all over the world. Uh, but this is the last iteration, cohort nine of this course is coming up. Okay. In March, we start in March and then um, it's going to go to bed and be updated and revised. And I can't wait because I'm also going to be planning a level two course. And that's oh, probably wow. going to happen in person. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. I love when you can have um, the best of both worlds and do that because it's great to learn online. I love to learn online but there's a particular magic about learning in person and especially yeah. with the nature of what you do. Um, you need that hands-on. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. It's great to put the foundations online mm -hmm. and then get advanced training in person mm -hmm. so that you're not sitting in front of PowerPoints and you're hands-on and you're talking case examples in person. It's I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, okay. Susanna loves, oh my gosh, you, you are, you're a newlywed. Congratulations. Thank you. You're, um, an instant mom, yes. <laughs> right? You're a 10 year old, a 10 year old. They're so sweet at that age. I know yeah. it can be challenging too, but they're so sweet. Um, I know she loves being outside because I see all her photos all the time <laughs> and I love it. And I love Asheville, um, loves movement, loves to travel. So we're going to dig into a little bit of all of these pieces but the first thing that I want to know more about, because I haven't heard the story 
mm-hmm. from you, I've read it, but I haven't heard it, is what drew you into breast cancer rehab? Absolutely. <clears throat> well, when I was 12 years old, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she was premenopausal at the time. I remember her telling us over the dinner table and, um, funny story. She actually had a boyfriend at the time and I got very upset and fell down the steps and, um, got angry at him. And she was like, this is a time for my family right now. This is, we need to be together. And my mom was a single mom to myself and my sister. And she's a nurse, retired nurse now, but she's a tough woman. I mean, she had ERPR positive breast cancer. Um, it had metastasized to the lymph nodes. She had, um, a lumpectomy and a sentinel lymph node biopsy, I believe, and then radiation and chemotherapy. And I saw her through all of that. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, you know, draining her port helping her drain her port from home. I remember giving her shots of Nulasta to get her white blood cell count up because she said that she could do it. And she was just so tired of going to doctor's appointments. And that woman, I think, and I don't recommend this, but you know, she was a single mom and she worked overtime. And I think she only missed a few days of work. So, you know, it was super impactful for me at that age, you know, just seeing her nauseous and holding back her hair and, you know, having hair follicles fall out. I mean, it just gave me such a great follicles. They stay in, but it gave me such a great sense of compassion for what people who go through cancer actually have to navigate. And then when I was 25, my best friend was diagnosed with neuroendocrine cancer. It's a very aggressive cancer that tends to happen in younger people. And uh, we did lose Courtney within a couple short years. Mm. Um, But, you know, then I went in, that was super impactful as well. And I went and did my women's health residency um, at Duke university. And it was a wonderful opportunity. I became a certified lymphedema therapist before even seeing my first patient there. And I noticed that we got a lot of referrals for lymphedema and lymphatic cording, but you know, I knew what it was like to go and hug my mom and have her pull away from me and, you know, and because of post mastectomy pain syndrome Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, And I just, the shoulder dysfunction that was coming through that we weren't getting referrals from, or if it did come through, it would just say like rotator cuff impingement. And that was so far off from what it actually was, but it was the medical diagnosis that was given to us. And, you know, just hearing people complain about peripheral neuropathy and fatigue, and then being in the pelvic health component of things and witnessing that I was the first person to ask them about sexual health when they were on estrogen blocking medication, you know? And so I was like, man, there are so many side effects that aren't being addressed. Mm -hmm. Like really medical care is about saving this person's life, but what about the quality of life? Mm -hmm. And so that was back in 2011 and 2012. And I was going to the research and there, it was just, I hate to say it, but at the time it was, it was pitiful. It was scant. And I remember being at a pelvic health course out in Seattle where Holly Herman was present and I was late to the class (laughs) classic, Uh, but I was a student. I wasn't teaching that one. And I got to sit next to Holly Herman. Oh, wow. (laughs) I told her, I said, I want to write a breast, I want to write a breast oncology course. And she held up my hand towards the ceiling. And I was like, I'm committed now I'm going to do this. Um, so I wrote that course and delivered the first iteration, um, with a colleague of mine, Christine back in 2013. And then I, uh, started doing it on my own. I used to teach it through Herman and Wallace around the country. And, um, that was a wonderful opportunity. Um, and yeah, and then COVID hit. And I took it out on my own and put an online version up and it's been amazing. We've, I've trained 123 practitioners via kick pink and, um, and that's just scratching the surface. I have really big plans for kick pink in the future for practitioners and people who've been impacted by breast cancer, both. 
Oh, my face is actually cracking off like from smiling. Oh, yay. Um, yeah, about everything that you've done. But, um, you know, just to go back and and just hold a little space for all that you experienced growing up, because I know that it's a, a massive driver, but it's also, you know, your own experience um, in that trauma, right? Yeah. Of having to live through that and see it and feeling measures of powerlessness, you know, like helplessness, knowing that she needed something specific or that something was missing and that it wasn't there. And so to get to the other side where you are now and to be an expert in it and be able to give people that care, I can't even imagine it's, you can't even say that fills a gap, right? Or that answer to missing, that's not, it's not that, you know, it's like you filled in the Grand Canyon, you know, with what you did because um, I can feel um, a measure of that personally since of course mine turned out to be negative and wasn't cancer. Unfortunately, I got to experience a lot of the gross, awful side effects of seromas and cellulitis and lymphedema and cording um, and all the shoulder problems and everything. Um, so I'm just so excited for what you're doing for people. And I want to talk about, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about specifics of when I know what I experienced when I came out. And, and I think I reached out to you early on um, and thought I'm, I'm doing great. And then things came back negative and then, then everything started to fall apart. And then I ended up in a second surgery. So my first question is, you know, when, when women come out of either they think they, there could be a diagnosis or they're coming up on that and they're going to have surgery of some sort, whether it's an incisional biopsy or a lumpectomy or what, whatever they are facing, um, what are the, some of the things that should be on their radar so that they can advocate for themselves? Because even as I am not, um, you know, an oncology PT, right? Pelvic health and ortho, mm -hmm. not oncology. So going into this, I wasn't really sure what to expect either. That is such a huge question. I can take it in so many directions. Um, I myself have had uh, my first scare was when I was at Duke mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. So even just receiving, uh, news that there's something that is abnormal, um, can really play with the mental headspace. Yeah. But I think that there are certain things that are underestimated and that the mental component is underestimated as well as like, for example, a biopsy, just biopsying the, the tumor before even getting into surgery, that can be incredibly painful for people. You know, um, people think, oh, you just had a lumpectomy, you know, mm -hmm. that is not the case. Like mm -mm. anxiety levels are actually higher in people post lumpectomy. And a lot of times, you know, people want to have a mastectomy so that they just feel safer and not having reoccurrence. And sometimes that can be um, uh, a lot of physicians don't want to do that. Um, I think that it's getting better, but we're kind of, do you hear that we're talking about like some medical gaslighting, for example, mm -hmm. um, there are some people that go flat or they have a mastectomy and they choose to stay flat and that can be discouraged. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people think that the win after a mastectomy is having the reconstruction, but the reconstruction can be, the reconstruction can have some of the most devastating side effects or some of the longest recovery times. And there are so many different procedures. There are a lot of wonderful plastics out there, but a lot of plastics, like you'll see that things tend to be done regionally. You know, there's deep flap, tram flap, lap flap, you know, there's implants. Um, then geez, talking about medical gaslighting, just things are coming to mind. For example, have you ever heard of sick implant syndrome? Mm -hmm. Um, 
where uh, women start to feel pain and fatigue. There are all kinds of side effects. And, you know, they're told it's not the implant or we don't want to take out the implant, kind of like an IUD and having pain with an IUD. Mm -hmm. Um, so that kind of covers some of the med that covers just some, some of the medical <laughs> Just um, some of it. Yes. But um, one of the things that is so important is preoperative guidance. And, you know, one of the things that you talk about so much is policy and reimbursement. We should be paying for prevention. Yes. And people will come to me and I am able to do prevention. Sometimes people will bill for prevention and receive reimbursement, but some people just choose to pay out of pocket for that. Mm -hmm. When you're able to see someone preoperatively, you're able to help them immensely with education and calming down their central nervous system and giving them yes. skills that make them feel empowered going into surgery. Yeah. So as a physical therapist, you know, whether they be young or old, you know, their past medical history, you're getting your baseline measures for shoulder range of motion. You see how their diaphragm is working in terms of breathing prior to going into surgery. You're getting circumferential measures of the arm and you're able to give them so many techniques that, pro that, that help with healing and then also prevent things like seromas that I know that you went through. Yeah, twice. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of times people think of a mastectomy as just taking off fatty tissue from the chest wall. And it is not that. Mm -hmm. Those lymph nodes, that fatty tissue, it extends into the axilla. All of that fascia, the vasculature, you know, um, the nerves in that area, the way that the anterior chest wall impacts the neck and the arm. Yeah. It's, it's not just taking off a breast. And so not. when you can see your clients preoperatively and you can get baseline measures, you can, you can see what their personality is like before they've undergone the surgery, before they understand exactly what kind of diagnosis they have, mm -hmm. you're, you really have a sense of that person as a human and who they want to be and what they want to be able to get back to. So I could go off on the importance of preoperative assessments, but even postoperatively, the, what we can help with postoperatively in terms of um, scar tissue mobilization, fascial mobility, shoulder function, mm -hmm. lymphatic cording, preventing lymphedema. It is rare nowadays, but it still happens because I do have, I do teach people in all over the place. And sometimes someone will come to me and I've heard this before from a, a, my, one of my own patients years ago. Uh, my doctor says that his patients or her patients don't get lymphedema. Oh my, what that, an ego statement. <laughs> that is an ego statement. <laughs> wow. And, you know, oh, you don't really need to worry about lymphedema because we only took out, you know, three nodes or one node. The fact of the matter is like from my own personal experience, I have seen people that have had lumpectomy with a, you know, oftentimes a separate incision in the axilla. I, I just treated a patient currently who had tremendous amounts of lymphatic cording. I have never seen cording like this extending down into the breast, you know, where into the inguinal region, down into the arm. She just, just, and I'm doing air quotes here. She just had a lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I know that people get post-operative knee and hip physical therapy because walking is very functional. Go through breast cancer treatment and you know a lot of people soar and they do well, but to have that person at your back that you can go to at any time should something arise is super important. So even if it is 
one preoperative and a couple of postoperative visits, you are going to sail in comparison to some people who get nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to, to comment on the, like just the personal reality of that for me, I think that let's say you are a healthcare provider, you know, your surgeon who was a good friend, right? Yeah. Um, does they can make assumptions totally well-meaning like, oh, you're a PT. Yeah, no problem. I've got this. I can handle it. No, no, you really can't. And, and the other piece of that is it might be um, just, just, okay, air quotes for people not watching YouTube. It might just be a lumpectomy, but you know, when, um, when I had my experience, um, it ended up being dissection deep into the lats and into the pectoralis because it had grown through all of those things. And so that's multiple layers interrupted that is pretty deep into what feels like now your back and your chest wall for something that seemed so small, right? That it right. really wasn't. And, and, and so I hear what you're saying when it, it's not just, you know, removal of that tissue where you think, oh, you just lop it off and it's fine. Not, no, not when, when um, tumors, when growths, whatever that may be, are, are actively growing through multiple layers of tissue. And so I think there's a minimalization, you know, out there, a marginalization, like, oh, it's just that it won't take that much. Well, it, it took me a year. Yes. To get through that experience. Right. And I think that there's, I want to speak to a couple of other assumptions and that is you're a physical therapist. You should know what to do. You are set up to be able to treat this population. If you know what you're doing, there are certain healing timelines that you want to respect post-operatively. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, I just, um, I just was listening to a woman named Jen McKenzie. She's a breast uh, cancer, um, rehab teacher, just like me over in Australia. And she was talking about, uh, the, the two different types of personalities, the boom and bust, you know, or the overprotective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that, um, I have been guilty of this. I had knee surgery and I'm a physical therapist and I'm active and I was feeling really good. And, you know, I'm watching people running around the lake and it's been six weeks. So I'm like, Ooh, I can try jogging a few steps, set myself back three months doing passive range of motion on myself in the morning. You know, like, I mean, mm -hmm. we, we are guides, we are guides, you know, that help keep people within the safe bumpers. And then, you know, I'm imagining a funnel and that funnel goes up and, you know, your ability to expand in what you do safely just keeps going. But if you don't have that guidance from the beginning, you can really set yourself back and you could have been a boomer and then you become an overprotective person and you don't get back to the activity level that you used to. And we know that exercise is good for prevention of breast cancer and to stop reoccurrence. Mm -hmm. And many other things like- so and yes. edema, right? We could talk about people avoiding movement or that kind of thing when we have these conditions. And in fact, it's, it's uh, the contrary. Yeah. So listeners, um, just taking a deep breath first, because I think is important because is I'm reflecting on what we just talked about. Um, there is a high potential for the most well-meaning providers um, and surgeons to go, you don't have any precautions. It's just a fill in the blank, you know, surgery, right? But then something happens. Um, in my case, uh, I got a seroma that persisted until it became infected and drain multiple drains failed and, and all that kind of thing. But in the beginning it was a, oh, well, it's small. You don't have, you know, nope, just get out there and, and get back to it. Um, which was well-meaning. It, it wasn't necessarily wrong. Like we're not here to like criticize because you don't know how bodies are going to, you know, respond. But I think that the first takeaway from 
kind of our first segment of talking about what to advocate for is to see if your surgeon and you do have direct access, a form of it in all states. It may be limited to 30 days in North Carolina. There is no limit. So if you're listening from North Carolina, come on over, no yeah. referral needed. <laughs> um, but we always want to uh, work you know, with your sur surgeon, whomever that is. But if you live in a state where it may be limited um, and or it's always a good idea to talk to them about that prehab appointment, can we set up a prehab appointment for you so that you know what to look for you and it tamps down so much fear because you know what you can do you can't do you know how to be careful you know um, what certain feelings um, that may crop up that may not be hurting anything but maybe just part of that pain process for post-op it's all that kind of education that you know Susanna you know way better than me um, to get that set up and then afterwards to like you said maybe it's one or two visits um, for someone like me, I was there for the better part of a year, uh, multiple times <laughs> a week. Um, but here's the, 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 the happy ending to that story is, you know, if you're watching YouTube, oh, full range of motion. Can I feel it a little bit? Yes. Is the cording still there? Sure. You know, do I have lymphedema issues sometimes? Yes. Is it all manageable? Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I could not have done that without a great, CLT without a great PT. Uh, my PT happened to be uh, a CLT. So let's talk a little bit more about what it looks like afterwards. So let's say you've advocated for your prehab appointment mm -hmm. and you're going to see that PT um, for um, your pre-op, all your pre-op, and they're going to help you calm your nervous system. It's going to feel great. You have an ally, you have an advocate, you have someone that you can ask those practical questions of and then you have your surgery, now what? So um, at your pre-op visit, you're given post-operative exercises. Um, I do wanna say that um, their breast cancer rehab is probably where it was at with pelvic health maybe 20 years ago. So, you know, we are collectively putting together a lot of the puzzle pieces and there are discrepancies there. So for example, I, I do really look at the research and even though it may be current research, I really look at who's doing it, how the you know research was done and what my experience is. So if that current research doesn't trump old research, that's better than, you know, I may stick with some of the older research. So for example, um, post-operatively, I am an advocate oftentimes of not raising the arm above 90 degrees. Uh, you can still exercise within that range mm -hmm. for, you know, it, at least until the drains are removed and for about seven to 10 days afterwards. The reason for that is because the more that we move our shoulder and sometimes even if we walk excessively, then we're going to produce more drainage fluid and it's going to leave the drains in longer. And so we do want those pulled once, you know, there is less drainage. Mm -hmm. So that also kind of has to do with seroma prevention, because after you take out, you know, they're, they're, after you take out fatty tissue um, and you're sewn back up, then that can create dead space that the body tries to fill in. And the body is very smart. However, sometimes uh, it can form a pocket or a seroma and they can be very small or they can be very large. And sometimes those um, can resolve on their own. We definitely advocate for some compression after surgery, um, but uh, sometimes they need to be aspirated. Yeah. Sometimes they even need to be surgically removed. So, Usually, you know, I give my patients quite a bit of leeway, but um, usually they'll, they want to, they, they want to come in at about a couple weeks post-op just to see how things are going. And I'll start to, you know, I'll start to do more education at that point. They have, you know, if they've had an oncotype, they, they understand a lot more about the type of can breast cancer that they have and what their treatment regimen is going to be like. And this is where 
we can be stars is that we can look ahead for them and kind of think in our minds, okay, these are some things that I need to educate them about. We don't necessarily want to do it all at one time because we don't want to scare them. Um, but we think ahead for them. And so, you know, it's a, a powerful lot, thing. Yes, it it's really incredibly is incredibly powerful thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it could be progressing someone's exercises to getting full range of motion and then moving towards progressive strengthening and core exercises. Again, it's definitely going to have to do with scar tissue mobilization. We're going to be assessing for swelling post-operatively. A lot of times that's just normal transient swelling post-operatively and manual lymphatic drainage can help. Um, you don't have to be a CLT to work in breast cancer rehab, but you definitely want to have someone at your back who is a certified lymphedema therapist that can field anything should it come up. Yeah. Um, but you can definitely work with prevention. That's and an important point. Can you repeat that again? Because, yes. um, you know, I don't think most listeners know what CLT is and that I think that's really important. Um, you said the thing about not having to be a CLT, but having one. And I, I have both hands in the air. I'm like, yes, you know, yeah. because I think um, it's essential. Yes. I think that there are a couple of reasons why people, I think that people that get into breast cancer rehab have been called to it for some reason, you know, they've either, uh, witnessed someone that they know who they're close to go through it, or they're a lymphedema therapist and they feel like there's more that I need to know. But there are a couple things that I think block people from getting into this area. And one is that they think that it's going to be depressing work. And that for, you know, is far from the truth for me. And for a lot of people that I know, it's actually some of the most fun and refreshing therapy oftentimes and, and lifting and uplifting. You know? You're giving Absolutely. them their life back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I ab it is my favorite population to treat. I could treat only breast cancer patients and be happy, <laughs> but you know, I definitely want to keep extending skills. But the second thing is that people think that they need to be a certified lymphedema therapist and go through two weeks of training and 135 hours of continuing education and expensive training in order to field this population. And lymphedema is only a small portion of that. I mean, let me just list some of the things outside of post-operative stuff that I've already talked about. Sexual health, mm -hmm. pelvic health therapists. If you can work in breast cancer rehab, and if you're a pelvic health therapist, you're a great candidate to work with this population, but you can work in ortho and you can also have a pelvic health therapist at your back because there are a lot of people that have sexual dysfunction down the road yeah. due to estrogen blocking medication or having their ovaries removed or, you know, just going through the trauma of this diagnosis and tightening your pelvic floor and your jaw. Yeah through yeah. that job hard in for yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's so true. So true. Yeah. But you know, osteoporosis, peripheral neuropathy, fatigue, you know, I, I there's just so many areas, but it's just, if you're an orthotherapist out there, it's slightly nuanced. It's slightly different. And when you learn how it's different for breast cancer patients, you're going to be better at being an orthotherapist whether you are in acute care, whether you are an outpatient at a skilled nursing facility or in home health, breast cancer, we see them across the continuation of settings. So true. Yeah. I, Ooh, um, that stress of going through the diagnosis and, and recovering from it impacts everything, you know, your, your, not just your ability to manage stress, right. Which you have to have this resilience and tolerance that just increases. Um, but then things like just the lifestyle aspects, like sleeping, getting comfortable, right. Getting, being able to get positioned. If you're on estrogen block, <clears throat> estrogen blocking meds and hormone dysregulating, you know, kind of medications, um, that as a natural consequence of taking it, that's, that's its job, right sleep is interrupted. Um, sleep among, is interrupted. You might start to critical. experience joint pain because estrogen mm -hmm. blocks nociception. 
within the joints. So, you know, people start to experience joint pain and then what do they do? Oftentimes they stop moving yeah. when what is the best medicine movement. movement, but tell me how, give me a prescription, be my coach. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cheer me on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, lymphedema for a minute. Okay. Because there's, I, I went through it. Um, and I was, when you were thinking, when you were saying prehab, I was like, what I would give to have had arm measurements before, yes. because it took months, right. Of taking measurements. It's better. It's worse. It's better. It's worse before insurance, right. Mm -hmm. Who's in control of everything would say, oh, okay, we'll, we'll pay for a pump now right mm -hmm. so talk to me a little bit about um what happens during that process and you know what that looks like what it feels like for people when that may be coming on and they're not sure especially if they didn't have any measurements how honestly are they supposed to know because we don't want to let it people i think many people think of lymphedema as just this obvious mm -mm. think of what it may have looked like 20 or 30 years ago it's it's not it can be so subtle Right. But then not to catch it early could lead to it becoming a huge problem with things later. And so tell me about that. How do you feel it? How do you know? What do you check for? What would be the ideal way to catch this and then treat it and manage Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So first I want to say that the lymphatic system is incredibly strong and also delicate. Everyone has a tipping point and oftentimes you can't see it, or you don't know that you're approaching it until you become symptomatic. And sometimes those, sometimes someone can experience transient symptoms where they're like, oh, my ring is fitting tighter, you know, or Ooh, my sleeve is making an indentation in my arm. That's weird. Or they start to experience heaviness in their arm. Or they wake up in the morning and they're like, my, my arm is swollen, but then they go throughout their day and it gets better. And then over time, it just becomes something that they're used to. Well, that can be an accumulation of protein within the interstitium underneath the skin and protein draws more fluid towards it. And it can also put you at risk for cellulitis because we feed off of protein and so does bacteria. So skin health is incredibly important in this population as well. Mm -hmm. So that typically people, um, they can experience transient symptoms or they can experience an onset of swelling. Now I have had patients, like for example, I'm treating someone right now who is 20 years post mastectomy and axillary lymph node dissection was told that she doesn't have to worry about lymphedema because it's been this long. She took an international flight, came home, oh, no. was writing a book and, and she could not type and she needed to be seen ASAP. Yeah. And, you know, we were able to get it under control and she's doing great now. And she's writing her book and she's doing a wonderful job. Um, but she thought that she was out of the blue, you know, out of the, she was, out she, of the, the out in the clear, yeah, in the clear, yeah, into Blind the blue and, sky, and, and in the clear, sky, wild blue yonder, yeah, um, but not, but no, and but, that's important, yeah, for so everybody to understand. The ideal would be um, a pre -op, pre operative arm assessment. Um, you can't just look at someone for the most part who has an onset of lymphedema and have them hold their arms out to their side and say, oh that one side is bigger than the other. I mean, I'm right hand dominant. My right arm is going to look better, look big, bigger. It's probably also going to measure larger in terms of circumferential measures. Um, a thing that would be incredible if every lymphedema therapist had it is an LDEX that people can stand on and they put their hands on it and it actually will provide you a graph and let people know, you know, if you're in a green zone, a yellow zone or a red zone. And you can track it over time so you can see how someone is even doing with that class one or class two compression. Do they need more? How are they doing, you know, with their <laughs> exercise regimen? Yeah. Um, so uh, earlier is better. Um, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? There's so many things that I can yeah, say. Yeah, so we started out with um, getting that measurement. Um, you mentioned an LDEX. An LDEX. Okay. They're expensive. Yeah. Okay. 
So a lot how of many, how, are, how common is it to have access to that? Very rare, especially in the United States, Australia okay. and uh, New Zealand, they're well ahead of the game in terms of um, mm -hmm. how they provide oncology care. And part of that is because of um, the way that they're able to practice and reimbursement. Yeah. But also I would say their values as a nation. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And that yeah. is where policy comes in folks. So we are going to take a, uh, a, a short break and I'm totally not joking to actually encourage you to vote. Yes. <laughs> Make sure that your representatives, when you look them up, who are they? Because I don't think a lot of people know who their local house um, member is or their senator is. They may look, know who their state, uh, their federal, you know, Congress uh, person is in terms of Senate and House, but many people don't keep up with their state representatives and their local representatives. And if you look up their voting record, you'll see what they stand for. And I am not a party person. I am on all levels. My bedtime is 9.30. Um, <laughs> I'm not a political party person either. I want to vote for the person and their policy and their beliefs. And so I just want to encourage you, you should vote too, because we want to support our health care by voting for people who are going to improve access to that care. Um, Absolutely. We shouldn't have to yeah, wait until we, we get something to go, oh, what does my representative believe? And if you're a lymphedema therapist in the United States, you've probably written your senator or congressman because in the past year, something substantial happened. The Lymphedema Treatment Act went through and um, that advocated for reimbursement for um, lymphedema therapy, but then also garments. So yes, access to more affordable, um, we call it the maintenance phase. So if someone, so if someone needs, um, continuous decongestive therapy, which would may look like uh, manual lymphatic drainage, compression wraps, mm -hmm. skin care, exercise, when you get down to a baseline level where you're no longer decongesting and your limb is staying at that size, then your lymphedema therapist is going to fit you for a garment to help contain you because one thing that I want to clarify earlier is that um, we did talk about proteins. Mm -hmm. So the lymphatic system does a couple of things. One is immune response. It keeps you healthy. Okay. And the other thing is fluid balance and homeostasis within the body. So your body has protein that plays a part of, of homeostasis of fluid. That protein starts in the arteries, jump ship into the interstitium. It draws fluid towards it. It nourishes the skin. And then when that pressure, um, basically when there's enough pressure, then it goes back into the lymphatic system. And then it goes back to the heart and it's processed by the liver, the kidneys. And that is something that you are continuously doing wonderfully and have no idea about. But what I'm saying is, is that your body continuously creates more lymphatic fluid. So it's something that oftentimes has to be managed. So once someone gets to that garment size that fits them, they have their maintenance phase where they're going to have to replace garments. And those garments can be expensive mm -hmm. where they have their exercise program, where they're doing their skincare and they're making sure that it doesn't worsen. They're in their maintenance phase. They're living with lymphedema at that yeah. point, but that can be very costly and expensive upfront and for years to come. And so the lymphedema treatment act made it so that that is more affordable for people. And so we should see hopefully fewer cases of extreme cases of lymphedema okay. in the future. Yeah. Does it make it easier? Let's just say if someone is in that maintenance phase and they have a garment, a sleeve, whatever that has worn out, how easy does it make for them to go back? What if they hadn't been to see that therapist or the managing doc in a year or two? How easy, or you may not know the answer to the question, but I'm curious because a lot of times, you know, people have that maintenance garment, they're going to wear out too. What happens for those people? Does it make it any easier for them to get those? 
Well, um, I will say this is that oftentimes because of cost, usually you have two garments. You have one that you wear, you have one that you wash and you alternate those daytime compressive garments. Mm -hmm. But people for cost effectiveness will try and it, you know, make that garment work as long as it possibly can. But you have an elastic band at the top an elastic band at the bottom. And if the sleeve itself wears out in the middle, then you no longer have what we call gradient compression where it's shunting the fluid back up to the axilla to be processed by the rest of the body or, you know, for example, lower extremity. Um, and so it can actually create a tourniquet effect and worsen things over time. So mm -hmm. having access to affordable garments is very important for the long yeah. term. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that um, I teach my patients how to self-measure themselves. And um, so they do get a comparison so that they can kind of track things over time. Um, there are places that people can order their garments directly, like through lymphedemaproducts.com. Um, but that's, I don't know about insurance in that regard in terms of payment, but oftentimes it is going back in to see the certified, the, see the CLT, have mm -hmm. them check you over, make sure that everything looks good and talk about, it's like shoe fit, you know? What's new on the market? I yeah. think that this would benefit you. Maybe you change it up because if you have provided something with, if you've provided someone with something that they're not able to stick to, that person may not even go back to that lymphedema therapist. They might find a new one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so it helps with continuity of care too. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited that that was passed. Um, it really hits home for, you know, how it, if people may think, you know, their their vote doesn't matter. It really does because a lot of these local elections, we always think about the big ones, you know, the presidential race or whatever. But it's these right. local elections that end up influencing our policy, and those local elections can come down to a vote, five votes. You are so right. Votes. I just got goosebumps because it's so true. Yeah. And I didn't really fully appreciate that until I was, you know, uh, decided to really you know, get more involved in policy a few years ago. Um, so yeah, if you're listening, your vote does matter and you matter. And if you're supporting someone with um, any of the issues that we've talked about with breast cancer, or you are struggling with it yourself, um, you know, we want to make sure that you get the care that you need. So I hope that this has been helpful for you. I know I learned some new things too. It made me um, have a lot of compassion for my myself, you know, going through my experiences a few years ago and, and certainly has increased, um, um, I guess, you know, all the feelings, you know, that I have for, you know, what, what you're doing and how important it is that um, if we think, you know, people don't know enough about pelvic PT, I think that in, in many ways, this, they have no idea, right, in terms of what someone can do with um, oncology PT and breast cancer. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for taking this time out um, to educate us all. And because what are the stats currently on breast cancer? Oh, well, it's still one in eight, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. So, um, you know, survivorship rates are improving. Mm -hmm. Um, however, I think that the age at which people are being diagnosed is decreasing. The majority of my patients right now are about my age and I'm 42 years old, you know, in their forties. Yeah. And when, you know, pre when, when you have breast cancer prior to menopause, sometimes that can be a more aggressive form of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So, um, just to kind of si sign off, um, I just want to, um, encourage people to get to know your breasts, the best time to palpate your breasts or touch them, um, is after you've had, you know, after you've gone through your monthly cycle, uh, the tissue is less dense and you can really feel what's going on there. Some people will say that that can, um, create false positives, or you may think that you have something that, um, you shouldn't be 
scared of. And for the majority of the time, that is the truth. You can have, you know, just benign cysts in your breast. However, I'll say that uh, I oftentimes ask my patients how they discovered their cancer. And oftentimes it was them or a partner. Mm -hmm. Um, the mammogram guidelines change all of the time. Um, but right now they're sitting at, if you're at average risk, you should have a mammogram every couple of years, starting at the age of 40, it used to be 50. Um, there, if you're at higher risk, uh, like for myself, I do want to let you know, like, for example, I saw my oncologist, not that I've ever had breast cancer, but, um, she, uh, I told her, I don't want to have regular mammograms because it is radiation and, you know, I don't want to have one yearly. And so we actually did a genetic test. It's called Invitae. There's other types of cancers in my family. And so that, I think that was a 42 panel test that looked genetically at what I may be predisposed to. If your insurance doesn't cover it, it's a transparent flat like a few hundred dollar rate that you would pay out of pocket and you're informed. If, if you have had a primary relative with breast cancer, like, you know, a mother or a sister or, you know, something like that, then your risk does go up. So genetic testing, understanding that profile for yourself is important. And um, yeah, and then, you know, there are other options, for example, you know, if you're at higher risk, um, an MRI is an option that gives you a much clearer picture. Uh, some people do have dense breasts that the mammograms, which is basically an x-ray of the tissue can't pick up breast cancer. And there's also ultrasound too. So I just want people to feel as though they can advocate for themselves. Yeah. Is that genetic test uh, a direct to consumer or do you actually have to go it through? Is. I believe it is. Okay. So it's I N V I T A E. And you, you may have to have a prescription for it. I'm not sure I did, but if you have, I, I cannot understand why a doctor wouldn't necessarily prescribe that simple blood or saliva test to right. get you that information. Yeah, we'll make sure we add that into the show notes because that's a, a very powerful piece of the puzzle for people who are concerned. I know I have that in my family. It's genetic. I'm at high risk. And so that would be a, a great interest to a lot of people I know. So we'll include that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, Susanna, for um, bringing all your wealth of knowledge and your passion. It's going to make and is making a lot of difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to do a shout out that if you do want to learn breast cancer rehab, um, cohort nine of Kick Pink, you can go to kickpink.pro, check out what that um, course entails. The last cohort uh, of this iteration is starting in March. So I would love to okay. see more people entering the ranks of breast cancer rehab. It would yeah. make all the difference in the world. And it is one of the most rewarding areas you could ever treat in, in my opinion. Fantastic. Is there anywhere also where they can find you? We'll include that in the show notes as well, but where else can they find you? Yeah. So if you're uh, someone that wants to see someone um, personally, uh, I do treat patients through your core PT uh, in Asheville. And then if you're a practitioner, you can go to kickpink.pro and you can get more information there. There is a blog and um, I'm combining kickpink.com, which is meant to be for people who have had breast cancer. I'm merging those two sites together just to streamline that information to the masses. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful work you do, Ginger. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> a humble thanks. <laughs> Take it in. You're awesome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs>